Okay, we have uh, Doyle Brewington. Yes, sir. Who is the founder and chief technical officer of PowerTube Incorporated out of Houston. Mm -hmm. And we have Christine Kubat. Yes. Who is with Moku Power. And uh, she's the chief executive officer. And that's right here in Hawaii. Ne. It <laughs> is. <laughs> and you guys have a new technology and you're working on it together. So, Doyle, why don't you tell me what the technology is? Well, technology is based on geomagmatic production of energy. Uh, the word implies we don't use water. The device that we use is put into a, a well. The well has to contain heat, a certain amount of heat. And uh, due to the thermal riser operation of the power tube, which is what we use, we can extract the heat energy up to the boiler level of the power tube. That allows us the uh, luxury of not having to use water, just the heat of the hole that uh, we extract the energy from. So now you, you, have, you have extracted heat in some way from Correct. down in the earth. Correct. And uh, you are conducting the heat up through the power tube. Through the power tube to the heat exchanger. And the power tube, it's going to go through an exchange of some kind and make right. steam or something? All of this, no. We don't use steam. We have a uh, combination of materials, which are isopentane, isobutane, which boil at a much lower level. They produce basically not steam, but vapor. And the vapor is under pressure at a low temperature, uh, 226 degrees to be exact. And that turns a turbine, which in turn turns a generator. It's a closed system. A closed system. So and how then, do you return the steam to its original condition? Uh, the liquid, it goes through the turbine. As it exits the turbine, it goes into a condenser. The condenser goes back into a liquid. The liquid is pumped back into the heat exchanger, and the circuit starts all over again. So the condenser requires some energy. Yes, well, the condenser itself uh, allows the heat that comes out of the turbine to be exhausted through the condenser, and as it goes through the condenser, it converts back to liquid. Okay, so I guess the big question is uh, uh, the power tube itself mm -hmm. that draws the heat out, out of the ground. Correct. Uh, without uh, disclosing anything that has not yet been disclosed, <laughs> how do you do that? Well, basically at the base of the heat exchanger, there's a device called a thermal riser. <clears throat> now, this heat exchanger has about 6,000 feet of stainless steel tubing. Inside the stainless steel tubing is the isopentane, isobutane. But that whole bundle of steel tubes is bathed in exotherm 400, which is a heat exchange a liquid. And that goes all the way down to the bottom of wherever the thermal riser has found the heat. And so it circulates down through the outside section of a coaxial uh, tube system. In this case, it's a little more, more uh, uh, sophisticated than just coaxial. And uh, when it gets down to the heat zone, it, uh, the oil gets hot. And then it's pumped back up through the center into the heat exchange chamber, uh, which causes that exotherm 400 to heat the isopentane, which forces it out through the turbine. So it's this, it's the, the tubes that run through the, the power tube, mm -hmm. this uh, mo multiple, well, one, one big, big tube that does a lot of convolutions. Yeah, it's a, serpent, it's a serpentine tube. Uh, the, the, uh, the heat exchange is about 40 feet long. Mm. And uh, on the one uh, megawatt unit, for example, it's 29 inches in diameter. On the 10 megawatt unit, it's 52 inches in diameter. So uh, oh, that's pretty big then, huh? Mm -hmm. But it only gets buried uh, in the ground down to 180 feet maximum. From there on down, you use a thermal riser. The thermal riser basically is in 5, 9, and 12 inch diameters. And uh, that extracts the heat and brings it back up to the boiler or the heat exchanger. Okay, the, the thermal riser, what's the, what's the, what, is, what does that look like? A uh, thermal riser is, uh, you have to imagine a coaxial pipe, a small pipe inside of a big one. Uh, it goes down a certain length until it hits the heat zone. Then the outside pipe becomes a coil, and it wraps around the inside pipe, which is still a straight pipe. 
And the reason for that is it allows the uh, exotherm 400 or the heat exchange fluid to maintain itself in the heat sector a longer period of time and more volume so that when the fluid returns up hot, you lose less of the temperature on its return. So you have to drill? Yes. How deep do you have to drill? To where you can hit about 300 degrees. And normally that's, uh, our tests have been down to 7,500 feet, but normally we don't need that depth, especially around here. What do you need in Pune? Mm, what would you say, about 300 to uh, 1,300, somewhere around there, 1,300 feet? That's, that's less than geothermal is using now. They're, they're using deeper wells than that, yeah. We don't need the temperature geothermal requires. They require about 600 degrees. We only require 300. Ah, so you don't have to go down as far. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that plays into uh, the recent discovery of the shallowness of the, uh, the mantle under Hawaii. Are, are you familiar with that? No, but we have a, a very, very good consultant uh, well, for that. Well, I know you have your consultant with you right now. He can probably be heard on our microphone because mm -hmm. we got a nice microphone. So we have uh, Michael Knight, Ph.D. from Knight Enterprises. So, uh, so Michael, uh, you're, you're not on, not on the screen, but uh -huh. uh, uh, there was recently a discovery uh, reported. Two researchers, one from California, one from the Midwest, and they uh, they found, to the surprise of local volcanologists, that the mantle was actually much closer to the surface than had been previously thought it was as close as 1.9 miles down. That's still uh, pretty deep, you know, it's deeper than I think mm -hmm. uh, what you're talking about. But, but uh, what it means is that more places in Hawaii are hotter, closer to the surface than we thought. Exactly. And a lot of magma chambers are quite shallower than that even. Yeah. We, we are now fully, fully qualified here with, <laughs> with a geologist. Uh, Michael Knight, also from Geological and Environmental Solutions, terrific. So, um, yeah, Michael, we were talking, before we broke there, we were talking about the, uh, the new discovery over the mantle in Hawaii, uh, and I guess you're the consulting geologist for the power tube uh, project. Um, uh, and I just uh, wanted to know your take on the effect of that discovery on this project? Well, that would be a very positive effect by having a, a closer source so we don't have to drill as deep. It would be a lot less expensive to install these power tube systems. Mm, okay. So what do we need for the power tube? How, how deep? Uh, well, you, you said the temperature had to be 300 Around 300 Fahrenheit. degrees, yes. And uh, that means what? In Hawaii, what kind of depth do you need to drill to? Well, probably uh, in the Pune area, a couple thousand feet, and then we'll need about a thousand foot length of the uh, of the tube in in that heat zone. Correct. The riser. The riser. Okay. So we probably have to drill to between two to three thousand feet. Okay. The, and you slant. And there could the be way? other places where it's a lot shallower, but uh, and depends on how close in the rift system we are. Uh, are you a volcanologist uh, acquainted with the Hawaii topography? That's correct. Yeah, I'm a volcanologist. Uh, my PhD is from the University of Hawaii. Oh, okay. Well, that's where they got that's where they got volcanology for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was really surprised to find that the researchers who found this thing about the magma did not come from Hawaii. Yeah, well, a lot of the the magma chambers in Kilauea they think are a little bit deeper than that. I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> So now that means, uh, th this means if you, you can go shallow this way, it means that there are a lot of options available to you, not only in Pune, but in um, many places. That's right, Hawaii. Maui, um, there's some rift systems there that are very promising. I think um, you'd like to have that built in maybe all the islands if possible. Yeah, so it could be a local uh, distribution, so to speak. So you have to do slant drilling? You, you could, but uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily, no. It could be straight down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, Doyle, are you also uh, a geologist? No, sir. Electrical, electronics is my background. And I uh, spent 11 years developing this. I had uh, 30 years of development of power plants around the world. And the uh, basic reason that I got into this in the first place is that I 
found myself as being one of the polluters of the planet. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> so what happened is a lot of my power plants, five and 6,000 uh, LMs, uh, gas, turbine, and uh, that type of thing, were creating the pollution of the planet because the people that were putting them together and leaving them in like the third world countries is that nothing was said about the cleanliness of the exhaust of the material. There was filters for the exhaust, but they're expensive and the people in third world countries don't want to spend their money on that. And so the exhaust of these units was straight into the atmosphere, uh, creating uh, nitric oxide, uh, leaving these exhaust systems and creating acid rain mm. in return. Mm. And in one particular case, in one particular country, they lost their uh, entire cotton crop for two years because of this acid rain that came down until they realized what the problem was and I was one of the people that put one of the turbines in there. Mm. And, uh, so you, you accepted it sort of, uh, 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 sort of an interactive responsibility for that? Yeah, so, well, I, my family background, my folks are missionaries. And one of the things that we're always taught and always hit into our heads when we're talking about this world is that it's not ours, we're here to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the things that my parents always put into me. So when I realized what was going on, uh, this pollution problem hadn't really been brought to the surface um, no to the late in, 90s. No pun intended. <laughs> into the, yeah, to the late 90s, you know. So as a result, uh, uh, my realization of the problem came uh, that I was one of them and I had to do something about it. So I spent three years studying all kinds of environmental energy uh, products, especially the type that can give back at low cost, fast installation, uh, with the lowest amount of pollution possible. Then I realized that most of the countries in need of that energy are sitting on it. So it was a matter of converting that energy into electricity, and to do that I had to go through several steps. Hmm, that's quite something. So uh, this is largely metallurgy? And it's largely, uh, you know, a study of uh, uh, inducing heat through the right metal to, well, it, to put it through um, an exchanger. Well, it's uh, thermal technology for one, electronic uh, technology, because the device is controlled by a programmable logic controller, which uh, controls 175 points on the power tube, and it sends all that information back via a SCADA system, which is a satellite control system. Uh, where you can see the tubes anywhere in the world operating in the SCADA center and you can control their operation. In other words, if there's a problem, you can correct it uh, by either uh, cutting down a valve or opening up another valve or reducing the RPM oh. of the turbine, I all by remote. Yeah. Uh, so there's great. quite a bit. It's not just one science. It's quite a few sciences. <clears throat> so there are moving parts. Yeah, there's one moving part and it comes through the, uh, the central point of this device is called the monocoque turbo generator which is a unique type of package. One of the problems that we had originally was lubrication. How do we lubricate something, bearings, that are in a, an environment that's over 200 degrees, and at the same time, uh, this environment would not uh, destroy the lubricant itself? Well, it turned out we couldn't find a lubricant that did that. And most lubricants would last like two years in that environment. They get very thick and they would no longer lubricate. So that meant that we had to have refrigeration, but we couldn't use refrigeration because that becomes a weak link in the chain, especially underground. <clears throat> so the monocoque turbo generator I designed over a period of one year. What it does, it takes the uh, isobutane, isopentane, which is our propulsion fluid for the turbine, which happens to be the C4, C5 in the hydrocarbon scale, uh, use it as a, um, uh, lubricant and as it comes out of the turbine inside this one casing which is a monocoque casing as it comes out of the turbine it drops in temperature by 120 degrees uh, then it goes through this casing where the bearings are wide open they're not sealed and as they go over these bearings it lubricates the bearings the bearings are ceramic they're not steel we found that steel wouldn't work for lubricating with isopentane butane 
And uh, then as it goes through the system, it also picks up the heat of the generator that's inside this monocoque turbo system. And as it comes out the other side, it goes up to the condenser and it's converted back into liquid and pumped back down to the boiler and starts all over again. But the monocoque turbo generator, in which anybody can pick up on the uh, internet, pick it up as you can, they can see the design of my patent. Yeah. Spell it. Pardon? Spell it. Monocoque, M-N-O-Q-U-E-C, uh, it's M <laughs> M-O-N-O. M-O-N-O-C-O-Q-U-E, monocoque. Okay. Turbo generator. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay, so it had moving parts. That means that at some point something's going to fail. It's What's got it? one shaft. It's got one shaft. And one, one shaft. And everything rotates with that shaft. So the shaft actually rotates, and that's why you're talking about lubrication. Mm -hmm. So um, let's assume the lubrication isn't perfect. Let's assume the uh, it, it, you know a shaft the shaft burns up. Uh, how do you how do you fix that? Well, we don't. The design of the system is made to last five years. Actually, all our suppliers have to provide a performance guarantee for six years. At five years, we take the four modules out, the working modules, and replace them with four new ones. Those modules we took out go back to the plant and get updated with new equipment that has been found during the five years it was underground. But it's designed for six years, uh, but we only let it run this five years. This sounds like the Deacon's Chariot, where you, um, you design everything to last exactly a certain amount of time and then it fails right on time <laughs> <laughs> well it's designed to last longer than the, the period of time that it's underground I see yeah, yeah. okay well, um, so what uh, have you got a working model operating somewhere uh, we've had two models uh, the MB 2000 which was a, a monster of a model because we started out with 10 megawatts uh, we had two 5 megawatt generators one on top of the other but the turbine wouldn't tur start them up both at the same time the turbine is air started and it wouldn't compressed start air. compressed air yeah we did that because if you take this into different countries i don't want to haul diesel powered equipment to start it up with I, so you take compressed air with you in a tank we take the six bottles of compressed air and uh and you're sure it'll start each time oh yeah well, that's, that's got, a fair certainty right there it's got 15 minutes of air uh, to start it takes six and a half to start it. It's not like my outboard engine where I have to pull the cord no. and I'm never sure whether it's going to catch. No. In this case you know it's going to catch. Yeah we know it's going to catch because we've got the temperature, the heat and the reading instrumentation that tells you the sequence of start. So it tells you that it's going through its sequences and when it reaches the uh, RPM which is 10,000 RPM for the turbine at that point the sequence of all the green lights that came on they shut off and the red light comes on that tells you, hey, we're under, we're under our own power now. Kind of like starting then, a jet engine, huh? Yeah, so then, you, and then yeah. you have another sequence of green lights that come on saying, this valve's working, that valve's working, this pump's working, everything's working. So uh, I just want to get the, the, uh, the kind of vision clear. So you, you, you have this broken down into pieces that are transportable. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you take them into some, say, some developing country somewhere. Mm -hmm. You dig a hole, you need equipment to dig a hole, yeah. and drill below that. Mm -hmm. And then you um, start it up with the compressed air, and um, you let it go for five years, and it generates right. power for five years. And, right. and what exactly, what are the levels of power that it generates? One megawatt, five megawatts, and 10 megawatts. The okay. study that we made, that's our market niche. Okay, well that's pretty substantial uh, power. Yes it is. If you get to 10 megawatts, that's, that's, that's correct. pretty big power. And, but this wouldn't be for a city, it would be for uh, a smaller community. Well, there's a certain country that right now have, uh, they have 1,000 municipalities. And yeah. by putting one megawatt in each one, it takes care of the municipalities. Right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very unique because it keeps them from having to haul in diesel on their trucks. Uh, because in that particular country, they have guerrilla activity. This isn't Egypt, is it? No. <laughs> and uh, well, we're here to talk about power tubes <laughs> in Hawaii. We're going to get to that. And, and we do have a plan to use it in municipal areas, in developed areas. There's yeah, no okay. reason it has to be in a remote location. Okay. Well, just just to, to continue this thought. So you you put them down in the ground. They're electronic, and everything lasts for five years. Then mm -hmm. you replenish as necessary. So you have a, yeah. a regular replenishment schedule. There's a replenishment around. schedule and replenishment control. All recyclable. And you oh, and you're saying it? 
all recyclable. Reusable. Yeah, reusable. right. Or reusable. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So how, how big is the unit that you have to take out? Well, there's four modules. It depends on the size because if you're talking about one megawatt, uh, you're taking it, talking about uh, about 60 feet worth of modules, which isn't a big deal. No. Can you can you cut that down? Can you? No. You, there's four it modules. Come in sections. Or you yeah. There's four separate modules that make up those 60 feet. Length. So that's 15 feet apiece. Yeah. Just about. No. Um, like the 10 megawatt unit is about 180 feet long. That's 180, right? Okay, so it depends on what what module you. Yeah, and that's about. 90 feet of, of modules. So and, and uh, I I can order the one I want, based on my my load. Mm, no, uh, the system is fully controlled by a PLC that goes to a SCADA system, which is a satellite controlled remote system from which they can control the power tubes underground. They can even change parameters on the programmable logic controller by flipping switches or touching buttons that are on that uh, control uh, master panel. Okay, so the, the, now you said that you have a working model or a series mm -hmm. of working models now. We've had two working models and now we're going to the certification process, the civilian and uh, military certification process. That'll be in this next few months. Okay. And, and uh, have you had a working model with, um, with the satellite control? No. We have a temporary system set up right now where uh, when a gentleman is trained on how to work the touchscreen computer to maintain that uh, operation and uh, the module calls him when there's a problem and he can see on the module itself what page of the computer that problem is on so he can go back to the control center, which is only 10 meters by 10 meters by 3 meters high, and he can uh, work on the touch screen, go to the page the problem's on, and correct the uh, deviance. Okay, so that, uh, where, now where is, that's at the ground level, the control center? At the ground level, yeah. The, the, the footprint of the power tube is only 10 meters by 10 by uh, 3 high. Okay, so that's 30 by 30 feet by 30 feet by mm -hmm. 3 high. Right. Mm -hmm. By nine, by nine, ten feet high. high. Yeah, ten mm -hmm. feet high. Yeah. It's a room. It's a room. Yeah. And you, it's a door, and you go in, and inside is some electronic equipment. Right. On the one side of the room, you have the control panel system, which is the conversion system. A forty-one sixty is what the power tube produces DC, and that forty-one sixty can be converted to fifty or sixty cycle, or from two hundred and twenty to thirteen point eight kV. And the the turbine is in the room. No, the turbine's down below in the ground. Oh, below the it's okay. it's in the monocoque turbo generator system. Okay. That contains a turbine, the generator, and the bearing. Which is the first section. Mm -hmm. As you as you go down. The down first the section shed. as you leave the as you leave the uh, uh, heat exchanger. Right. So the second section down so, the top is the super condenser. Mm -hmm. So somebody th nobody has to be there all the time though. No. This is an unmanned type. That's of, right. Uh, instrumentality. Correct. So, uh, and the room has to be a very strong material to prevent malicious mischief and the like. Well, uh, different customers want different rooms. The military mm -hmm. wants one that's already set up with, uh, protected by Kevlar and I don't know what all, but I can't tell you much about that. The other people uh, want something that looks that it blends into the background, looks like a house, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some that are just uh, like square boxes um, that are in the area painted the color of the gray stone around them. Yeah. So yeah, so it, that, it really it doesn't necessarily call attention to itself. No, it does not. No. This reminds me of the spruce. You ever hear of the spruce? Spruce goose? Uh, nope. No. No. This, uh, no. Nope, this, but it it, it does have a, a, re a resemblance. It's a nuclear a nuclear generator oh. that Toshiba makes. I see. And it's about the size of a Volkswagen on top. Mm. And it's the, the width of a spruce tree. <laughs> oh, I see. They dig a hole and put it in, and mm. it lasts for I don't know 20, 30 years. Mm. Uh, Whatever you know, size gives you a different uh, power. Yeah. They're having, I think, some trouble deploying these, obviously because <laughs> it's nuclear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do you do with the waste material? Well, they say it's supposed to be clean. They say it's supposed to be safe. Modern nuclear reactor, and, it, and it's a it's a minimal size. It's mm -hmm. not a very big thing, and, yeah. and it's made for small communities. But yeah. I, I don't think they've deployed it very far. I, I don't think it's been covered very well in the press yeah. either. Anyway, uh, back to yours. So, um, so you would you would um, like to use this here because this is the laboratory for energy, especially it's just more, renewable it's, energy. It's more than just the laboratory. What, what about Hawaii? Well, Hawaii has the, the heat under the surface, so that would make 
this kind of device very, very functional, mm -hmm. I guess. That's correct. We're looking perhaps at also putting the SCADA center, the receiver center for the world here. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, enter uh, Moku Power, Christine Kubat. Yes. And what can, what can you do for Doyle? What can I do? I can make Doyle's uh, dreams come true here in Hawaii. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself first, how I'm involved in this. I'm a bona fide tree hugger, anti-geothermal activist, arrested in the rainforest, stopping geothermal development. Um, from that experience, I went and I was an original intervener in the PUC process to begin the integrated resource planning for Hawaii. I decided I wasn't going to just be against geothermal, I was going to be for things that were better. So for about 16 years, I was on Helco Citizens Advisory Group, pushing back against what I call dirty geothermal. And uh, I want to declare right here, anyone who thinks that geothermal has been a great success in Hawaii, that they owe as much to the activists as they do to Puna Geothermal Ventures, because the original design for the plant and the original intention with the open venting and the dumping into the unlined ponds was not anything that would ever have been successful. So until the community members stepped up and protested these uh, technologies and abatement systems that are now part of that plant that make it work were non-existent. So we get a lot of credit for that as well. So there I am and I'm sitting on the uh, Citizens Advisory Group and every time somebody talks about geothermal I get very uncomfortable and jump up and down and uh, for the longest time I've been telling everybody we need to look at more benign technologies, that there must be advances in geothermal development, we need to look at low temperature technologies, and I can't imagine why, but nobody pays attention. <laughs> so here we are, second big push for geothermal, Richard Ha and his group on our island with Wally Shibashi and Carl, who I guess is now going to uh, go someplace else, Carl from the PUC, and maybe who is it? Carl. Oh, Carlito. Uh, yeah. Calibaso? Yeah. Boso? Yeah. As of yesterday. As yeah. of yesterday. So maybe now Hermina is going to be uh, attending our meetings. But maybe you have a job? What's that? Maybe you have a job for him? For Carl? Um, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I think we'll discuss that off air. <laughs> anyway, uh, so there I am at the meetings. They wouldn't let me be on the advisory group, but they do let me come into the room. And Richard Haw is very gracious and he lets me talk. And uh, there I am, I find myself saying the same thing. Low temperature, more benign resources, and again, I find no one paying any attention. So one day I sat there and I said to myself, you know what, I'm gonna go find it. So I went online, clean geothermal. Next thing I find Doyle, Doyle and I start talking. And I believe we've been on the same path, uh, parallel tracks for about 11 years. He's out there putting his mind to how can I create this beautiful, elegant, I call it elegantly evolutionary and highly disruptive. And we're getting a little bit of shock waves about the disruptive part, but I can talk about that later. So have you traveled to see the working model? I traveled to Texas. I, I made a pilgrimage to Texas to meet Doyle in person, to go to his office, and I left there feeling like Joan of Arc. I just can't tell you uh, how I felt because it's been a long, long time that I've been praying and hoping that there would be something clean that would take advantage of the heat in the earth, but would not put our community and our beloved host culture So you're satisfied this is going to work? 110 percent. Because, Absolutely. you know, your whole, if you were opposing uh, geothermal at Puna, uh -huh. and now you, and, and saying that you want, you want lower temperature geothermal, uh -huh. and now you found Doyle, and now you, you know, you, you invest, so to speak, in this project, it had better work, eh? Your your whole shtick is riding on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My shtick? It will work. It That's will right. work. Here we are. We're the team. Part okay. of the team. We're going to make this work. Absolutely right, Phil? Correct. But here we are. Live TV, live radio. We're going to make it work. Um, so I found Doyle, and our company, Moku Power, is the joint venture partner. If you want to be involved with this technology in Hawaii, you need to come see me. How's that? Okay, well, you're really on the other side of the street now. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no sides of the street. Didn't you listen to Neil Abercrombie? We're all on the same team now, Jay. Oh, good. We're not debating just for the sake of debate. We're all good. working together. And now you're going to find out about the world of permitting. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. Wow. Well, I had nothing We're going to solve say. that problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've had some background on the permitting part. There's a company organization up in uh, Colorado, <clears throat> and their uh, basic uh, entity is called uh, Mount Princeton Geothermal. It's a colony for millionaires, I guess, retired millionaires, 5,000 of them. <clears throat> uh, that's what I understand. And they were going with geothermal. EPA came along and said, you can't do that. We don't have enough water. And uh, they went on to that uh, situation and said, well, what are we going to do now? We've developed all this thing. And they found Partube, came down and talked to us, and we put a package together for them, which was acceptable to the EPA. Well, let's, let's talk about where you can go now. I mean, unless you got it all worked out, you can just tell me. But wh wh what's the step, okay? We've well, got the technology. We've mm -hmm. got a working model. We've got the ability to manufacture this, you know, with, with mm -hmm. multiple repetitions, I guess. We've got uh, the, the geology. We know what we need in terms of sites and venues and all that. Um, where do you go from here? I, I wasn't kidding when I said welcome to the world of permitting because that's the challenge in Hawaii. And as you know, that, that for every person who wants to build something, there are three of them who don't want them to build that. So now you're going to find out. Well, I've been out networking uh, within the community, friends who stood online and got arrested with me. And I find for the most part that people are very supportive. Uh, the man who holds the record for being arrested at more geothermal protests or more often at geothermal protests than anyone else calls this the dream that's going to get rid of the nightmare. He is behind it 110%. And uh, so we're, we're working closely with people at that level, and we're developing our strategic plan. I would say right now we're going around courting everyone that we can imagine. We just Bring the community into it? Right. Right in the beginning. That's the most important thing. <coughs> Bring the community right. right into it. Yeah. You know, because, you know you, of course you have the technology to make it work, but you also have to build community support before you can go very far. Mm -hmm. We just came here from the 14th floor at HECO where we met with the engineers there and uh, that was hooked up via telephone to Miko and Helco at the same time so they were listening in. We met earlier in the day with the representative from Kuoka'a and we're just going around flirting and holding hands with whoever you know likes us at this point and then we'll start to make our decisions about what we're going to do. But you have to understand that all of this is happening when Mr. Brewington here has just thousands of orders for his units. Was that right? Yeah, why don't you share a little bit of this? Yeah, let's, can we talk about that? Uh, so, sure. Yeah. I met him at the airport with a hug, and he produced this paper with... Um, a purchase order for $200 million worth of power tubes with a back uh, document that is uh, bankable, can be used for advances. From the bank. You want to see it? We have it. <laughs> we can uh, I don't you. know if I can really show that on oh, television <laughs> because we've got an NDA <laughs> well, with these people. Just, we'll uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, why is it? Why uh, this is a lot of money? Uh, mm -hmm. How much does it cost for a single unit? It depends we on the unit. Don't know. We're uh, not. We're not sharing that information exactly yet because there's a lot of costs related to drilling and siting, and we don't know. Well, just to manufacture. But it's 15 percent below the going prices for one megawatt. You mean for other kinds? Of other renewables. kinds of energy. The closest energy to us, we're still 15 percent below it. Well, let, let me let coal me just be the cheapest. That on a and being coal the cheapest, yes. But of so course, it's 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 going to be cheaper than wind. Oh, much cheaper, yeah. Cheaper than PV. Oh, yeah. Cheaper than conventional geothermal. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, geothermal has a problem. First, they have to go and select the site, and they got to blow off a lot of steam to see what the site is going to produce. So once you've got your site production, then you design your plant. By the time you finish that plant, everything else has been three years. Our thing is to mass manufacture. We go into one hole. It takes 90 days probably to get down to that hole, plus another 90 days to install. So in six months, you've got a power tube plant. And the power tube gets shipped here in a 40-foot container. And it's shipped in a 40-foot container, basically, for the 10 megawatts. It's also designed to fit in a C-130 for emergency services. So we don't mm, have the... military. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the cost related to... We don't have to have re-injection wells. And we don't have to do all the monitoring. I mean, we're still going to uh, come under the purview of Department of Land and Natural Resources because, you know, we're drilling. But we're definitely going to come in cheaper than conventional geothermal. 
So mm -hmm. where can you put these? Uh, have you have you had a decision made a decision about what mm -hmm. island you're going to be on and what neighborhood? We're that's all up in the air right now. Mm -hmm. mm. We're so, deciding. So uh, how but how do you make that determination? You know things are moving very rapidly, and I would have to say to Richard Haw's credit and Kuoka Off, they've done nothing else in this climate. They've lit a fire under everyone's. I mean, things are happening fast, and people are really wanting to reach out and maybe even go beyond the HCEI goals. So, you know, this is all evolving, but we thought it was critical to come and talk to Mr. Jay Fidel at Think Tech Hawaii. Wow, I am touched by that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and let people know that we're here, and to make sure that this big push, okay, so here we are again on the second wave of um, promoting geothermal to make sure that the policies that are created, that any kind of legislation uh, benefits us as well because conventional geothermal has about a 20 year head start on us and uh, you know there's a lot of research that needs to be done. All the research that's done and has been done in the past doesn't necessarily benefit us. That's why we have Dr. Michael Knight here to but help It will us. help. It will give us some history mm -hmm. of what's, some history. what's down there. Right. Definitely. What so, about the, uh, you know, the people who were involved in opposing geothermal at Puna you mean like 15 me? years ago, like you. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You, you can't necessarily speak for all of them, and I'm wondering, you know, there are cultural issues there. There mm -hmm. are cultural Definitely. issues. And yeah. I how, do you, how, how does this equipment get around those issues? Okay, well, for the first... First thing I need to say is that as I sit there at these geothermal working group meetings, and we had a meeting earlier today with Senator Mike Gabbard, and he has the same basic observation, is that people are more open to increase geothermal development now than in the past. So uh, to PGV's credit, since the blowout, since the problems that they've had, they've been able to operate and maintain that um, plant in Pune uh, without causing major problems. So people are more acceptable. And as I sit there at these geothermal working group meetings, I see people come in, filter in, uh, sit down, testify before Richard and Wally Ishibashi and basically say, okay, uh, you're going to do more geothermal. Uh, this time, let's make sure we do it right. So the mantra has become, let's do it right. This is doing it right. And when we sit down and we explain to people, uh, tomorrow, uh, at HCEOC on Hawaii Island, we're doing a reception, and there'll be the people there on Hawaii Island will be exposed, you know, to this information. Um, the response is very, very positive. I mean, people say to me, "Have you gone to talk to people in the community?" For instance, like the Leilani Community Association. I'm calling up my warrior buddies, and I'm saying, "Hey, what do you think about this?" And so far, the response I've gotten is very positive. I will say that within the Hawaiian community, there are some people that are holding, uh, you know, a harder line, and I completely respect them for that. People want to dismiss the Pele legends as myth. But, you know, there's a lot of good science in there. I had a, a beautiful meeting recently with Pua Kanahele, Auntie Pua, who's largely regarded as the matriarch of the Pele clan on our island. And she looked me in the eye and she said, Christine, can you guarantee me that by taking this energy and using it to make electricity, you're not preventing Tutu Pele from making land? Because Tutu Pele is a god goddess to her, but she also has a mission, which is to create more land. And can you tell me that if you take her energy, you're not preventing her from doing that? And I looked her in the eye and said, no, I can't tell you that. I really can't. I don't know. But then I get to talk to Michael. And I you know, get to tap, in, tap into his mana'o, his expertise. And I found at that meeting that Auntie Pua, she's very open-minded. She basically says to me, if you can find someone who can tell me and can guarantee. And now after talking to Michael, I feel confident that I can go back to her and say, a one megawatt demonstration project is minimal, the amount of energy that we would require compared to what Tutu Pele has to offer. And while I don't know why she does what she does, I know she certainly can communicate. And if you're amenable to let us go ahead with your blessing and proceed with our demonstration project. That's what we're trying to do within the next year, get one demonstration project up and running um, and see what happens. And I can't speak for her, but this is the climate that we're working in now where people are much more open-minded. The other thing that we have going for us is this, is, this operation is not profit-driven. We are working to create a model where a large percentage of the um, 
revenue stream, which is basically all money that's being saved. Instead of spending this $1 billion a year on our island and shipping it off island, it's being uh, captured now. How does that money stay in the community? That's the kind of model that we're trying to create. So when you deal with these communities of Native Hawaiians, that's very important to them. This is not just some kind of money suck, energy suck that's just taking everything out of the community. We're working to create that kind of model. So we I'm invest in the community. Well, but I, I want to understand that. Uh, you know, Doyle was talking about uh, some credit line or whatever that, that somebody's going to buy from you. Um, so the same thing would have to happen here. Somebody would have to write a check to, uh, you know, to, to have these devices installed. And that, that money's not going to stay here. That's going to go back to Texas, isn't it? No. Uh, the only, the, a lot of the money stays here. That's what it's designed to do. So are, are you saying it's a, that? It's a percentage of the, a, a, a good percentage of it stays here. First of all, a huge percentage is going to stay just in the because lower cost. Why? Well, because first the value of all, is coming from somewhere else. You, first, have, you have patented devices in this. That's country. correct. So uh, the, va the But they have a fixed value. Yeah. And then the value that's that's generated, A, the lower cost of electricity, for example, yeah. mm -hmm. that those margins and everything stay here. Uh, the basic point is when this whole system was devised, it was devised for three levels. One, get rid of global pollution, and I can explain how that works. Provide electricity at a lower cost, especially for developing countries. Why? because I found that 25 to 30 percent of manufacturing costs in developing countries is electricity and if you can drop that to 10 to 15 percent they become more competitive on the world market <laughs> and you don't have these huge populations going from this developed country to that developed country looking for work. Absolutely. The country yeah. with the better power is going to be the, the, the better society. And the clean, power. Society. Clean, power. clean power. Clean power, of course. That's where we are. Clean yes, power. that's correct. So, but my question though is, um, you know, how, 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 do you, how do you arrange, what's the business model here? Uh, I mean, I know you come from a family of missionaries. Yes. And they, like, they like to give back to the world, and that's mm -hmm. what this is all about for you. That's what it is. Yeah, we don't, we're not in there technically to make a lot of money. We're in there to provide clean energy to reduce world pollution. And I'll explain how that does too. We've got 20 joint venture centers around the world that are special centers that are set up uh, geographically by either the zone that is ethnically uh, compatible or that have treaties between countries. For example, we have one of our joint ventures is in Chile. That is for the medical sewer countries. If I were to send a PAR tube to Brazil, it would cost me 150% duty, non-competitive to begin with. If I send it to Chile, they put it together, and because of the treaty, all, it only pays transportation costs. So I'm setting up 20 of those centers around the world that over a period of two years, they develop into centers that have their own assembly plant. That assembly plant can build 500 units a year. If we have that, we have a production model for 10,000 units a year. One 10 megawatt part tube reduces earth pollution by 400 tons a year. That's combined. That's compared to any hydrocarbon plant. It eliminates 1,240 tons of coal, the use of that coal, and all its pollution. So if we get these place where it's supposed to be because the energy cost is so low, it's not com you can't compete with it, you're going to have a reduction of 40 million tons of pollution on this planet. I hope I've reached that goal. That's my goal. But that'll be every year because of the production for the surrounding seven to eight countries that are in these programs. How about Hawaii? How many units do you think would be appropriate here? I don't know. I don't know what the total megawattage is that you We're use. We're deciding. We're going to use as many as we can to the extent that it's appropriate. Welcome to the world of permitting. Welcome <laughs> to the world of purchase power agreements. <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, <clears throat> you can provide these to a village without having to go to the electric wires. Because? Because it's a standalone unit. It doesn't need to be attached to anything. So you just put it in the middle of the village. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, doesn't bother anybody. That's right. And you just wire them up 
to, to the central hub That's of this device. Well, the, <clears throat> the interesting part is there was a grant provided to Ecuador, for example, which came from uh, carbon trade equivalent to $30 billion to keep them from cutting down the rainforest. Now, the place where they were going to run electric cables out to these series of villages created a problem because they had to cut all these trees down to create that corridor. With the power through, they didn't have to touch those trees. Distribute it. That's what it is. You That's what it like, is. It's like that spruce thing I talked about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have yet to follow up on this, but in talking, <coughs> for instance, with Representative Faye Hanohano at the state legislature and also our new Senator Gil Kahele, immediately what comes to mind uh, with them is working with Department of Hawaiian Homelands, and as they're doing the um, uh, you know, community development on their lands. And so there's that potential. But to get back to your question about how do we keep the money in the community, the first thing we do is we're in a position to charge less for electricity. So if people don't have to pay so much for their electric bill or if they have the idea that they want to set up a business and you know what they pay for electricity for their business is not so high, then the money immediately stays within the community. And then Well, no, I mean you're you're contributing to the grid. Somebody is going to be writing you a check. Okay, so you get a check for $1,000 for power that your device has generated that you sold to Helco, for example, on the Big Island uh, under a purchase power agreement. So the, the $1,000, where does it go? Okay, um, that's one way to look at it. Negotiating the power purchase agreement, that's going to be based on what it costs us to deliver the power. We're clear that it's going to cost less to deliver power from our system than conventional geothermal or a lot of other sources. As I sit on the geothermal working group, Jay Ignacio from Helco is part of the group. He comes to the table. He says they're looking to retire their oil fired generation because it's costing them a lot. Right now they're losing business. You know, sitting on that citizens advisory group for a number of years, I've seen the projections. Well, they're below their projections for demand because all of a sudden people are installing their own solar systems. You know, they're worried about the cost of oil. Helco is anxious if they can find a suitable replacement to uh, stop their oil fire generation units. So I believe when we sit down to negotiate with Helco to get a power purchase agreement, which is only one of the scenarios, we're in a position to go, for instance, directly to Department of Hawaiian Homelands and sell our power to them. We're in a position to go directly to a hotel. I mean, one thing you have to understand about this is that people cannot buy these units. What we offer is a lease in perpetuity. And Mr. Brewington here, from his past experience, is very clear that he wants to keep uh, firm grip on the technology and make sure that everything that's out there is actually working and functioning the way it needs to function. Right. But we come to the table with a very strong position to negotiate a good rate. And we're not negotiating that rate on our behalf so that we can, you know, put a big hefty fee on the top and make a big profit. We're at the table for the community. That's there. I mean, he's a missionary so, family, but we're all on a mission. I, I'm getting that. Okay. <laughs> so now suppose, suppose a hotel. Mm -hmm. So then I take it uh, that you would take an appropriate size of, of power tube mm -hmm. and install it right there at the hotel. Sure. Or and, right and there. And the, the hotel would become the lessee of this equipment, mm -hmm. and it, would, it could have the benefit <coughs> of this equipment to run its hotel, right. mm -hmm. not to sell it to anybody, just to run the hotel. Mm -hmm. And to so provide their electrical needs, but also transportation needs, because they could make electricity for electric vehicles, they could produce hydrogen, or they could produce compressed air. Have you seen those cute okay. little compressed air cars that kind of tool around? I you see know? what you're saying mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you go sort of uh, uh, community or, or business by business, facility by facility, and you wouldn't necessarily go on the grid. Not necessarily, but we can. I don't really have a problem with the utility company. I've learned a lot about them. I empathize with them greatly. So, but are you saying that if the utility comp company offered you X dollars per kilowatt hour, uh, you would say, no, 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 that's too much. We'll take Pretty less. Much. Oh, yeah, we're not greedy people. We're not. You're right. We might take said. less. Yeah, that's what you said. We're our demands are modest. We want to make sure that these things are out and running. We want to stop pollution. Clean up the environment. Yeah. That's correct. Get mm -hmm. Hawaii okay. off oil and so, lower the cost of electricity. So where does this fit? I mean, let me sort of put it in a context. Where does this fit with the underground, a rather undersea cable? 
Oh. <laughs> interesting you'd ask that question. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> what do you mean? Everybody's I've heard, <laughs> We've been talking well, about this. Well, it's all the buzz. I've heard so many numbers. Yeah. The distance that electricity would have to travel and the cables would require 20%. You're going to lose 20% of the energy just pushing it through those cables. So the amount that's going to be required makes it prohibitively expensive. That's my viewpoint. And we're all excited to dispatch Dr. Michael Knight here <laughs> on, on his mission, which is to get us some cost figures. Um, you know, the drilling is going to cost, it will have different costs throughout the Hawaiian Islands. And so I'm sort of thinking, well, could we get together some sort of a scheme, sort of like on the line of insurance, where we're able to levelize the cost? And maybe there's a pool of money. I'm not sure who's making the money off that cable, or who's financing it, or how they're doing it. But let's compare. Let's look and see if we took that money and we spent it to bring down the cost of drilling, to distribute the cost across the system. Could we have power tubes on each island and not um, use use that money for the cable. And I have to say, you know, as a tree hugger, probably you don't get too many tree huggers in this office, so I'm, I'm going to go on this well, tangent. We have our share. Oh, you mm -hmm. do? Okay, well, here I am. And, um, you know, when it comes to the cable, I hear all this talk and people ca talking about the costs and this and that. Did anybody ask the whales? I mean... Well, about the coral reefs. Every, the coral every, reefs. Every Who's here bring to it on speak shore? for those other life forms? Mm -hmm. And it's not just about us and what we want. And I had a very beautiful conversation with uh, Bob Lindsay from OHA, and I put that question to him. I said, yeah, Bob, did anybody ask the whales if they want these huge cables with all of these EMFs going through their breeding grounds or, or through the places where they live? And he said, no, Christy, no one did. And they're an important part of the web of life. And so that's my bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, I come to geothermal development as an activist who put her Okoli on the line and got arrested in the rainforest. And I'm willing to put my same body parts on the line. Why am in I reminded discussion. of Millie Lonnie Trask? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. I don't know. She's also a geothermal developer these days. Did you know? Yes. So, so I mean, it's the whole thing seems to be turning around where. Fifteen years ago, it was it was pretty uh, pretty vituperative. Now uh, you guys are in a more positive place. But she's supporting geothermal, as as it is written, in Pune. Uh, mm -hmm. So you wouldn't agree with her, then I take it. I like her model, her native to native model. I think she's got a lot to offer in that respect, and uh, I believe we have the technology. I, I do. I don't see anything better than this out there. I'm calling it the holy grail of the clean Well, can you, convince her, to, can you convince her to come around to the power tube? Uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, we're flirting with everyone right now, <laughs> and we'll see <laughs> who we end up married so to. Where is, where is Richard Ha? Is he, is he in the courtship? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Does he prefer the power tube to no, uh, conventional I can't. geothermal? Oh, I can't say that. Mm -mm. But we're talking with him. We've met with Ted Peck. And we've met with their, uh, are we, should we be telling this stuff here? <laughs> Is this know. too much disclosure? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <I> <laughs> Is this too much information? We've met with representatives of Kuoka'a. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we'll see. I, I really believe, all kidding aside, you know, I'm trying to be jovial because, you know, this is media, it's somewhat entertaining. But all kidding aside, I really do believe that Neil Abercrombie has it right, that we're all working together on this. So we're open. We're talking to everybody. Well, you guys are an interesting team, definitely. Uh, you know, the science and the, uh, what do you call it, community affairs, if I could use that term. Tree hugging, go ahead. Tree hugging, um. I, yeah, don't hitch the, don't, <laughs> and of course the university in geology. You must know Don Thomas. I sure do. <laughs> he, he played a role in geology. He sure did. And still does, I guess. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, I wish you well, you guys. Thank you. I think Thank it's you. a really very, very interesting moment and worth following from a journalistic point of view. That Definitely. You've got the tree huggers, the tree huggers now, uh, you're the woodsman. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't go that far. I'm a driller. Things have definitely changed. You cannot equate what's happening now with what happened in the past. You can't. This is a clean technology. It well, I, I, I hope that you don't run into any resistance. Uh, the irony would be 10 feet tall or maybe 60 feet deep. Uh, but, but it'll be very interesting to see where the, where the activist community comes out of this project. 
Mm -hmm. And I agree with you absolutely that you've got to talk to them, yeah. we, as we everyone are. does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are. I talk to myself about this every night, and when I have my close friends, I it's call them on the phone. It's a reflection experience. Yes. But one thing I'd like to close with is that Mr. Brewington here has many, many orders for these things uh, backed up, and we have charmed him into believing that it's appropriate to give at least one to us here in Hawaii. So I would like to invite everyone who's involved in helping Hawaii meet the uh, Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative goals to support us. Uh, in getting that one megawatt demonstration project up and running uh, this next year. Anyone who has mm -hmm. anything they can do to be supportive and, and helpful. Well, I hope you let me know when it's scheduled. Okay. Oh, we're going to let you know all the exciting be, things okay, that happen, Jay. I'm looking Jay. forward to that. Uh -huh. Very good. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. I would appreciate you guys coming down. Michael Knight of Knight Enterprises. Um, Christine Kubat of Moku Power. I love that name. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Doyle Brewington of PowerTube Incorporated in Houston, Texas. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Appreciate Aloha. your time. Aloha. <laughs>